Um, Adam Brock was instrumental as being one of the uh, founders of that organization and getting it off the ground. And um, I got to come in in its early infancy and and uh, volunteer and work there. And it just really um, inspired me uh, ab about getting hopeful about the future because um, uh, it really catalyzed a lot of things that have happened in Denver, Denver since. There's still a lot of work to do. And Adam is continuing to push forward uh, the opportunity for us to build as a community. He just recently wrote a book that I'm sure he's going to share with you, um, some of, of the teachings of. He also teaches uh, the local uh, PDC, um, that is permaculture design certification and some advanced design certifications in permaculture. And we uh, should give him a warm welcome. And I'm just super, super excited to be uh, here with you guys. So thank you, Adam, so much for coming. Thanks, Michael. All right. Well, I'd first like to just start by um, uh, saying a, a few words of gratitude. Uh, first to the people who were here uh, long before most of us, uh, the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, who stewarded this, stewarded this land uh, that was later stolen from them um, and that we are now doing our best to remember how to take care of. Um, I'd like to give gratitude to my own elders and mentors, those who I've learned from and, and been uh, privileged to study with. Um, and also uh, to give so much gratitude to the organizers of this incredible two-day uh, conference. Let's give them a hand. As someone who's um, organized many events myself, um, I could tell right away that uh, what, what these folks were doing was very ambitious and very needed. Um, and I'm really pleased to see how well it's been pulled off. Um, and I'm excited to see all of the connections that are gonna come from the conversations and ideas that were sparked here today. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing with you a little bit about my own journey um, and where it's taken me at the intersection of ecological systems and social change. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, my work at the Grow House, a nonprofit that Michael mentioned, um, as well as where my work has gone since then and kind of developing uh, a set of solutions, a, a recipe book, a pattern language for social permaculture. Um, and then I'm gonna be uh, asking you all to kind of uh, have some conversations with each other around how some of those solutions might uh, apply to some of the things you've been talking about today and the work that uh, you'll be carrying forward from these two days. Before we do that though, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit from you all. Um, so if we can just do a real quick, like one sentence, um, your name and uh, maybe one really inspiring tidbit that you've gotten out of your time here um, today or yesterday. Um, something, that, uh, something that you're gonna be walking away with uh, that's, that's new and different for you. Um, so let's, let's maybe start in the back and then we can kind of work our way around this way. Oh, I think you're on now. It's not on. Uh, I really want to say the thing that impacted me more than anything else was a plethora of information from all of these different groups, and it's pulled together in one conference. And I think that's absolutely... Uh, Fabulous, and I really have to commend Marie for mm. for doing that. Uh, but uh, that that's one thought I had. I was just it's fabulous, and I think being able to get that and then the realization, I think that we all have to work together, that's right. and we have to support one another in each of our separate areas because that's the only way we're ever going to get there. Great, thank you. You can just, yeah, pass it to someone near you who has something to say. I 
I have hope now um, because of all of the wonderful people that I've met in the last two days. Um, I'm close to crying because emotionally, um, I've been so sad for so long, I'm just grieving about what's happening in, in our society, in our country. And um, I, th I think um, I will sleep well tonight just because of all the new friends that I've made here. Mm. Thank you. My two words are ditto and hope. <laughs> I have nothing but praise for all the worker bees to put this thing together, to uh, share your wisdom and your knowledge, and the fact that together we can make a difference. And I think before I felt like there were just these individuals, so, you know, just individuals. And now it's, it's really a community of people who care, mm -hmm. and I love it. Thank you, and I encourage everybody to continue to build and network with everybody, and uh, don't let this momentum fade away. Mm. I just want to thank Noe so much. I want to thank Noe so much. Noe is leading uh, Green Latinos in Colorado, and uh, Proteyete is also, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but um, anyway, he's been really working with us uh, since we started um, uh, the larger group work in, in May. So thank you. I'm, I'm Tim, and I just arrived, and it's a good energy. <laughs> I just want to say gracias. Thank you, everybody, because I now I know that we're all going to be working together as a unit. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, I've enjoyed the focus on solutions rather than just the problems. I'm looking at the weather as the new abnormal. <laughs> Yes, for me, solutions, collaboration, and the spiritual dimension. I'm excited to see so many people involved in the movement. I'm grateful that I'm new to Colorado, but there are amazing people that I'm getting to connect with, and really excited that I connected with Brian, who's going to come and speak in my class this week. <laughs> We're going to go all, yeah, it's, it's exciting, and uh, just super grateful for the kindred spirits in this space. Thank you, Marie and Michael. Sure. Yeah, I'm Mercedes Perez Whitman, really honored to be here. Um, and I learned of some organizations I didn't even know existed in Colorado. So I'm really excited to get to know them better and hopefully collaborate in the future. I'm Cal, inspired to be here. I'm just going to say two words intergenerational co mingling. That means something to me, being here. I'm Anna, and I'm just so pleased to be in the company of people for whom the words doing away with capitalism and revolution are comfortable words. Mm. <laughs> So I, I, I'm Jim Schrack with, uh, and from Highlands Ranch, and I just say good job. I had a, I had a good time. Um, I'm Diane, and um, ditto on the 
doing away with capitalism and revolution. I, I'm Michelle. I've got to go read Martin Luther King, what he said about capitalism. I was really intrigued. I've been working on issues of equity and values, so I found everything very valuable today. Mm. Thank you. Scott Brown, just really impressed with the diversity here and feeling the potential for going forward. Well, I'm Rhiannon Gallagher, and uh, we say it's all connected a lot, but we don't necessarily act on those connections, and so it's really great to see them, to see them and be able to see them tangibly. Peter Sato, uh, one powerful tidbit for me, Rhiannon in her workshop this morning helped me to understand some of the power dynamics better about climate deniers mm. and the losses that they face if they acknowledge what's going on. Mm. I'm Kathy and I was only here today, but thanks to all the organizers. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Laurie and I'm so very glad I came. Uh, it's been very heartening to hear all of the uh, diverse feelings and opinions, and especially the more radical ones that uh, are acceptable to say. My name's David Carlson, and uh, the, uh, the tidbit I would lift up is that <clears throat> the process to shift from uh, extractive economics to re uh, uh, generative economics is merely uh, changing spectacles. Hmm. And uh, David was also an early supporter. Um, I'm going to get this wrong. It's EEE. -E -E. uh, what are which E comes first? <laughs> what is it? Uh, yes, I uh, also uh, convene a monthly uh, uh, forum at the Isle of School of Theology, mm -hmm. Ethics and Ecological Economics. Uh, climate change and uh, public health uh, are the, mm -hmm. is, is the major theme we're uh, running throughout the fall. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Great. Libby Como, I don't know where to start. Uh, I'm with the Loretta Earth Network, and uh, thank you to the organizers. I think the most exciting for me is learning from April Valdez, Rosemary Lytle, Brittany Heller, um, Mercedes, and Lisa Calderon. Uh, I'm, it's something about grid alternative, and it, it brings everything together. It's jobs, it's um, diversity, and it's uh, putting our bodies into the work of uh, regenerative um, energy. Hi, I'm Beth Winsky, and uh, I'm amazed at how uh, much I've learned and how this event has gone so smoothly. I'm so grateful to all of you who've organized it and for all of you for being here. Um, we paid I've, her to come in and say that it <laughs> ran smoothly. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Beth. <laughs> I'm a teacher, and I just say this this rocked. So uh, I uh, I've been teaching about climate change for years, and I remember the the warm ups that I would do with kids, saying, "Okay, what are you going to do as you get older, or even right now? How are you going to impact your your family?" And they they loved that question. They were always gung ho with it. And I had one kid uh, come back to me. And, and, and said, well, we're moving down to Colorado Springs, but we're still going to be going to North Arvada to go to school, and we don't care how much it's going to cost to drive. And I said, well, have you ever thought about what it's going to do to the environment? And that kid said, it doesn't matter. We can pay it for the gas. And so I said, I want, you, I want to just invite you to think about how that might affect other people. And so this kid, for the rest of the year, gave me a lot of, a lot of issue. And I usually don't have, have an issue with kids. And so uh, I just received an, e an email two weeks ago from this gentleman He's grown up and he said, thank you so much for dealing with me and for my attitude because I get what's going on now. So I just want to remind wow. everybody that I've learned so much and you've planted so many seeds for me, especially for zero net carbon, for what I need to do for my rental property and for my own home. And I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I'm so grateful to the gentleman from um, Golden Realty, Jim, mm -hmm. I forgot his last name. He, he is amazing. If you want to know how to make your house work for the future, he'll, he'll help you. And I can give you some of my resources too now. Um, oh, I lost my thought, but I, I, I'm just so grateful to all of this, and uh, I just I have tremendous hope, and I too believe that this weather and this climate now is abnormal. My name is Chuck Younger, and uh, I'm not used to public speaking, but uh, I thought of a quote, and I forget who said it, but it's 
the main obstacle to change is that we lack clarity of purpose mm. and imagination to think that things could be different. Mm. Hi, I'm Sandy. Thanks for a nice uh, seminar for two days. And I think the thing that's impacted me the most is combining economics with climate change and trying to look at things with a new perspective and getting a lot of new ideas from all the speakers here. And I really appreciate it. I'm Brian. I got invited to speak here because I yelled at somebody who was going to release mylar balloons into the environment at a rally. And I stopped that. But the truth is that that event was, um, is the first thing that I'd gone out into public after some work that I had done this summer. And um, I am so grateful to everybody, the organizers and everybody that's been attending today, the energy, um, because I needed it. I had a crash and burn after some stuff. And you, you gotta just remember that there's, you're not alone in this fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I forgot that for a little bit. So I really appreciate everybody here today. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm David. I um, have just been here today and I um, took part in a couple of the more technocratic uh, tracks of you know, how we get to 100% um, renewables in the power sector and so on. Um, so I, I got a couple of pieces there, but, um, but mainly it's just nice to be in a room with so many people whose um, focus is how to save the world together. I'm Gemma, and I'm grateful to be here. Grateful to Michael and Marie and Martin, especially who uh, are the nuts and bolts of keeping it together, uh, knit together. And I look to the future. Uh, hi, Chuck Kutcher. Um, I guess I'd like to thank Marie and also uh, Paul Bellinger for inviting me to speak at the beginning of, the, of this two days yesterday. <clears throat> and I guess what I would say is just that uh, it's really, really encouraging to see so many people that are have such high energy and are so enthusiastic about uh, tackling these uh, problems head on. So I think it was a great two days. Yes, I'm Milt Hetrick, and I just wanted to thank Marie too. I think she and the rest of the organizers did a fantastic job in putting this uh, conference together. It had a tremendous scope to it that I didn't anticipate it would have. So I really feel privileged to have been able to attend. Um, Milt and a number of other people will be are organizing a follow-up conference. Mm -hmm. I think it's likely in the spring on green building. So we'll go, you know, deeper into that area. And I think they're going to host it at their new retrofitted uh, zero net energy building. Well. Hi, I'm, I'm Janet Wise, and I've just been here today. I picked up um, a lot of cool things from Rianne and today, but one was... Um, that it takes only 3.5% of the population actively supporting a movement to really affect change. And um, I thought that was a powerful number, 3.5% of the population. Thanks to everyone for organizing this. I'm Chuck Carlson, and uh, I'm grateful to the organization here that, that we would call a church for doing this. And um, whether you regard these problems we're talking about as ethical problems or financial problems or war problems, uh, they break down to being problems that our churches should have been facing for the last 200 years and have failed to do. And I've been involved in an organization that has worked in that end, and I believe that we need to go home and demand that our churches demand peace mm. and start there. And so with that, uh, thank you to you organizers and especially to the people involved in this church who've mm. done this. Thank you, JUC. We wouldn't have this wonderful space. Uh, I'm John Camper, and I'm hopeful that we can 
build some lasting connections with all this positive energy that's been generated. My name is Nancy, and my takeaway is just the power of the intersection of all these groups and the importance of showing up. Um, groups like uh, the Poor People's Campaign, Working Families, NAACP unions, these are groups I wouldn't normally think of showing up, in a, but now in addition to my environmental ones, um, I hope to be there. John Russell, um, hoping that we continue to uh, try to make things better. Moji Aga, I'm an Iranian-American Sufi monk and peace and justice activist and of course Mother Earth activist. And what I love about the today that I've been here is the translation to some extent of what Rumi said. Mm. Rumi said 800 years ago, give me thirst, not water. <laughs> give me thirst, not water. So I, I love to see so many people who are thirsty as opposed to seeking quick um, satisfaction of water. Mm. Great. Is that everybody who wants to share? Is there anybody else who wants to share anything? Okay. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Alfredo Macias. I'm here accompanying my wife, Kenzie Serrano. And um, all I have to say is thank you. Uh, so much knowledge in this room. If we put it together, it's probably hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and um, uh, I couldn't think of any, anywhere else to be. Uh, this weekend, we want to thank, I want to thank Marie, uh, especially for uh, allowing uh, two of my kids to come today and one yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was a little rough, but you know they enjoyed and uh, being with such great people, I'm sure you know, it gives them some positive attitude. Um, so I just want to say thank you. I came in late, so thank you, um, Marie and all the organizers, Paul Bellinger, um, for the diversity of talks, organizations, communication. Um, don't forget most people are working, don't have time to think about this. They're going paycheck to paycheck. We need to get policy changes. Go vote. Get the get the vote out. Let's make changes um, to government if we need revolution. If we need, hopefully peaceful, but decarbonize and consider sequestration options as well. Thank you. For those that say it can't be done or we can't afford it, you can tell them. Get out of the way of the engineers that are doing it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for, for sharing your thoughts uh, and your gratitude and your learnings and also for uh, bearing witness to everybody else's uh, what, what they had to say. I think it's really important that we take the time um, and that we uh, practice patience in hearing everyone in our circle, um, even if we're not quite arranged as a circle, make no doubt this, this is a circle that we're in right now. Um, on that note, I'm going to ask you all, I'm going to invite you to uh, raise your fist. Look at the ridges of your knuckles. They go up and down, up and down, just like the mountains, just like the river goes back and forth down the valley. Turn your fist to the side. Look at the edge of it. It spirals, just like the water behind a rock where the trout stays. There's no square people here. We're all round. You can put your hands down. That was uh, something that was shared with me by one of my mentors, Joel Glansberg, and it was shared with him by a Hikaria Apache. And I think it really captures this idea in very poetic words that no matter how much we get ourselves worked up in our heads 
around uh, these man-made concepts of economy and uh, science and religion and ideology and, and even language, at the end of the day, we are animals. We are living, breathing beings that inhabit an ecosystem, as much as we try to deny that. And by remembering our essential humanness, our essential aliveness, our essential connection to other species in this biosphere, the more we can remember that and reawaken that aliveness within us, the more the solutions to all of these problems that we've created will just feel uh, natural. They'll just start to make sense. We'll, we will know what to do. Because again, as, as so many people have said, the answers are here. We have the answers. We already know what to do. How many people here are familiar with uh, the phrase or the practice of permaculture? Raise your hand. Great, that's a lot of hands. So I'd love to hear some of those people who raise their hands share what they feel uh, permaculture means to them or what their understanding of it is. Yep. Um, I heard a lot of people say the word regeneration a lot. And I think it's about owning our capacity to heal each other, ourselves. Mm. Great. And that also means social harm, not just ecological harm. Right. Could you repeat that? Oh, no, I don't know where oh, we're whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, for me, it's about regeneration and uh, the capacity of any living system to renew and heal itself and continue to create vitality and viability around it. Um, mm -hmm. And that means healing social harm as well as ecological harm. And my experience with permaculture has been in a contested landscape in mm -hmm. Austin, Texas, uh, that was uh, likely to in an area that might have contributed to environmental gentrification mm. and had a history of police brutality in that area. And so um, regeneration meant really knowing the ecological and the social history of the place um, mm. and creating a space where we could go to work on healing all of the social fabric and the soil. Cool, great. Anybody else want to share what permaculture means to them? I associate it somehow with learning from the land mm -hmm. or from nature, and, and I think, as Elizabeth said, uh, being uh, very attuned and mindful of this particular place. Mm. Yes, it's so context-specific, so place-dependent. I also think of it as, um, you know, there are cultures that have managed their, their relationship with their places for tens of thousands of years, and we've kind of managed to break ours in about 200. So, so I think of it as partly learning from those cultures that have, that have yes. had that balanced relationship. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's been a lot of talk about decolonization these last couple of days, right? And that very much plays into what it means to, to walk this path of permaculture, is to undo the legacy uh, of colonialism, colonialism, both for frontline communities and those whose ancestors have perpetuated it. We all have healing to do. Um, yeah, I loved all of those answers. They were, they were very wise. Um, and permaculture is something that, that came to me, uh, I, I first found out about it uh, about 10 years ago uh, when I was just wrapping up my studies at university. Um, and I had been an activist. Uh, I had you know, been awakened to the perils of climate change and was doing a lot of organizing on, on my own campus. Um, and really just trying to wake people up to the facts of what was going on, right? And, and succeeding to a certain extent, but also um, starting to understand uh, how, how strong and forceful uh, the agents of status quo were um, and, and how many vested interests, particularly financial interests, there are in keeping us set on this destructive path. Um, and so it, it became exhausting, you know, pretty quickly I started to burn out from doing all this organizing. Um, but I wanted to go deeper into my understanding of, of sustainability because I saw that as the key to getting ourselves out of this mess. And as soon as I started to understand what permaculture was, this set of ethics 
and principles and a design process uh, for healing landscapes and social systems. I said, aha, this is the framework. This is, this is the thing that I've been searching for this whole time. And uh, so I started to really study it in depth and practice it uh, in my own uh, collective house where I was living in Denver. And, um, and I started traveling and, and wanting to learn more and more about what, what people were doing with this amazing set of tools and techniques and skills. And I saw some amazing things. I saw um, you know, a, a mentor of mine, Jerome Ossentowski, I met, and he is uh, growing figs and lemons and passion fruit in greenhouses at 7,200 feet uh, outside of basalt without any fossil fuels year round. And he has a mature forest garden that's, you know, acres and acres of dozens of kinds of fruit trees um, that feels like it's, you know, walking through the Garden of Eden when you're there. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, he couldn't manage an intern to save his life, and he was perpetually on the brink of uh, financial insolvency, right? And then I, I went to other places where uh, in, in urban communities, I saw people starting these uh, incredible uh, projects to heal food deserts, um, to, um, to make communities healthy again in places that were suffering from environmental injustice, um, using permaculture. And yet they were perpetuating some of the same colonial mentalities that had created this situation of injustice in the first place. You know, they had the best of intentions, but in so many ways they were making the problem worse. Um, I saw businesses um, that had great ideas for, you know, growing healthy food and selling it to people, um, but that they couldn't navigate the maze of licenses and permits through their city's zoning code to make their business worthwhile and they ran out of money and closed. And so what, what I started to, uh, deduce from all of these case studies is that the technology is here. We have all of the solutions, all of the technical engineering solutions we need, like, like that gentleman back there was saying, let's just get out of the way and let the engineers do their thing, right? If only it were that simple, but it's, it's true in a sense that we have the, the technologies for net zero or net uh, negative carbon uh, built environment. We, we have the transportation technologies. We have uh, the agricultural technologies to sequester carbon if we started right now to, uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change. Right? All of this stuff has been studied. It's been proven by uh, numerous scientific studies. It's in practice in places all around the world. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back our economic, social, and political challenges, right? And so what I, what I started to realize is if permaculture and everything that it is connected to is really going to revolutionize our society in the way we need it to, in the way we so desperately need our society to be revolutionized, we need to apply permaculture to those things as well. We need to use the ethics and design principles and design process of permaculture, which is rooted in ecosystems and indigenous cultures, and apply that to solving these same economic, social, and political problems that are keeping us from creating the beautiful world that we all know is possible. And so I had, uh, after graduating college, I was really, really fortunate to have the opportunity to, to uh, try this out, to see how this might be possible. Um, I don't know how many folks are familiar with the Grow House or with the community of Illyria Swansea. Um, this is uh, just off of I-70 in York. If, you know, whenever you drive to the airport and you get that funky smell from the Purina dog food factory, yeah, it's right there. Um, so this is a, in, uh, one of Denver's first oldest communities. It grew up along the emerging railroad tracks in the late 1800s. Um, these days it's surrounded by industrial infrastructure. It's this community of about 10,000 people, um, mostly Latino immigrants, um, surrounded by train tracks and sewage treatment plants and, uh, you know, the old Asarco smelter and power generation stations and these days a lot of marijuana dispensaries and grow operations. Um, and so, according to the EPA, it's actually one of the most polluted zip codes in the entire country. And uh, any of you who are familiar with Ditch the Ditch, the I-70 uh, activism campaign, that's right at the heart of that as well. Um, it's right now at the front lines of, of gentrification. It's just across the, the uh, highway from Rhino and all the crazy stuff happening there. Right? So it's kind of at the epicenter of all of these um, changes happening with Denver and, and all of these uh, long-standing trends of neglect. Um, from Denver's power elite. 
Um, and, of course, it's also uh, an area that lacks access to a lot of these basic necessities that most of us take for granted. And right in the middle of that, uh, part of that industrial infrastructure was an abandoned half-acre greenhouse that, uh, by really good fortune, we were able to buy. Um, and over the course of several years, uh, we worked hand-in-hand -hand with members of that community um, and got a lot of grants um, and a lot of amazing partnerships to renovate that abandoned greenhouse into a thriving year-round hub for food production, food distribution, and food education. So now there's three commercial farms there, a hydroponic farm, an aquaponic farm, and a mushroom farm, where we're growing about uh, 1,500, 2,000 heads of lettuce every week, selling them throughout the state, and then generating, uh, using that revenue that we're generating uh, to uh, be able to distribute food to people in that neighborhood at a really affordable price. Um, we're working with people in that community, people who are lacking not just healthy food, but economic opportunity to help them create co-ops where they can uh, cook food and cater food and start their own businesses um, and put more money into their pockets, as well as how to grow their own food, how to cook healthy, how to do yoga, things like that. We bring 2,000 kids uh, from all over the, the metro area through there every year on service learning trips to learn where their food comes from. Um, and on and on and on. It's just this kind of hub of all kinds of things. And what's made it so successful is not just the permaculture of what we're growing, um, but the permaculture of how we applied that to the design of the space. Um, so permaculture, you know, has this set of, uh, of a dozen principles or so. Um, and so, you know, the first principle is observe and interact. Just see what's going on, watch what's going on. Because any system, whether we're talking about a landscape or a social system, is much, much more complex than it appears on the surface. And so if we're really trying to create lasting solutions, we have to take the time to understand that complex system before we just barge in and say, hey, I know the solution. I learned it in this other thing I did somewhere else. So we spent years earning the trust of people in that neighborhood, of sitting in the back row at their church on Sunday and going to the Cinco de Mayo festival and watching the school play at the elementary school, making relationships one by one and really understanding what it is that people there uh, needed and were passionate about and were proud of. Um, and that years of, of relationship building was instrumental in where it's now at today, where people in the community really feel like they have ownership of this space and this is their nonprofit. Um, another permaculture principle is integrate, don't segregate. Right? And so, again, that has obvious implications for how we work with people um, and how we wanted to integrate all of the, the people from various walks of life, um, not just within that community, but from outside the community in solidarity with the people in that community who are suffering economically and financially and politically. Um, but also, integrate, don't segregate had to do with our programming and how we created mutually beneficial interconnections between the way we grew our lettuce and the, then what was composted there and that the students learned how to compost in the demonstration farm and then the food grown in the demonstration farm was sold in the market and then people who came to the market learned about our programs and how to get a job and there were so many different interconnections the way ecosystems, all the different species and ecosystems have different connections between each other. And one of the really key lessons you learn from ecology is that it's not the number of species or the number of organisms in an ecosystem that makes it thriving and resilient. It's the number of connections between those species. Because if you have a bunch of different organisms that are all disconnected, it's very brittle. It's very easy for any one of those organisms to, to fail, to, to have, to lack access to its food source or its shelter or water source. But if each one of these organisms is connected to multiple different ones, then if one of these uh, gets sick, if there's an infestation or if it gets overhunted or overfished and it leaves, there's still all these other connections that hold all the other organisms in place. And the same thing was true with our programming. Um, and so we had all these programs that were resilient and that didn't rely on any one financial source. We weren't just reliant on grants, but we earned our own income and were very business-minded. Right? So all of these different ways that we were applying permaculture, not just to what we did, the physical stuff, but how we did it. And that's led the Grow House to become this thriving organization that no longer needed me. I designed myself out of a job. 
which was my goal from the beginning. And now there's you know, 20, 25 people on the staff. Half of them are from that community. It has a million and a half dollar budget. It's continuing to make really big changes in that community and, and lift up the voice politically of that community as it's undergoing so much change. So that was my, my kind of case study, my in-depth immersion in how we can practice social permaculture. And I left there about three years ago because I wanted to share what I had learned there with other organizations, with other individuals trying to change their communities. I wanted to document how can we take permaculture and apply it in a very straightforward and tactile and design-oriented way. And that led me uh, to write this book uh, called Change Here Now. Um, is anybody familiar with uh, the phrase pattern language? Has anybody heard that before? Awesome. Great. So a pattern language was first developed uh, about 40, 50 years ago, or at least that phrase, uh, by an architect named Christopher Alexander. Um, and he was someone, you know, he was practicing in the throes of high modernism, right, when there were all these tall, sleek glass skyscrapers and big concrete plazas, and, and not to mention suburbia, and he could see right away that this was not a healthy environment for human beings. And so he traveled the world for years and years saying, what are the healthy environments and what do they have in common? Everything from you know, hillside villages in Tuscany uh, to small New England towns to African hamlets. And he took all of the patterns that he noticed there and distilled it into this huge book, like 1,200 pages, uh, 250 chapters uh, of what he called this pattern language, this set of solutions to the built environment. Everything from big picture things uh, like how we lay out our cities in relationship to mass transit all the way down to the way we design our buildings and how they face the sun and how deep the rooms are and how high the ceilings are, even to just like the way we arrange knickknacks on our bookshelf. All, all with the aim of creating convivial, thriving communities. And so that book was a landmark book. It inspired generations of architects and urban planners, but even more so this idea of a pattern language, a set of best practices within a given field, was inspiration to generations of people in other fields as well. So actually even in the, in the software development community, people now use pattern languages as just kind of ways of um, kind of shortcuts to, to write code. Um, in the permaculture community, we've started using pattern languages for how we design food forests and forest gardens and things like that. Um, and so I thought this tool, this idea of a pattern language, which by the way, you know, we, we all, we are, we're all intuitive to this idea of a pattern language, even if we don't know the phrase. So um, you know, anybody who practices yoga and who goes through different series of poses to achieve different effects, that's a pattern language, right? Each pose is a different pattern that we can then combine in different ways to meet the particular needs of, you know, if we're, if we're pregnant or if we have a sore back or, uh, you know, any, any number of things. Uh, pop music is, or classical music is just this series of patterns that we combine in different ways. So this book is a pattern language of social permaculture. It's 82 different patterns or solutions or recipes for what works based on my own experience, based on the scientific literature, based on ecosystems, and based on indigenous cultures. And it starts at the very broad scale, looking at you know, the, the design of society itself and what is the scale of society and how, what is the longevity of different societies, um, what are the sizes of different groups that make sense. Uh, then it moves to things about uh, how do we design social movements that, that work? What, what are the patterns of social movements that have been successful? And if we're trying to launch our own, how can we follow those patterns? Then it, there's, it talks about uh, organizations in, in a chapter that I call organizations that live. Um, so how do we create organizations or institutions that work like organisms rather than using this metaphor of a machine? Um, how do we make decisions in a way that's just and equitable and is actually um, following the values that, that we want to create in the world rather than the, the values that we were born and grew up with. Um, then there's chapter on, uh, or a whole section on economics after capitalism. What does it mean to, uh, to exchange in maybe a, a big complex society? How do we do that in a way that, that doesn't incentivize destruction, uh, but rather incentivizes regeneration? How do we look at wealth in a much more multifaceted way than just dollars in a bank account, but really understand that there are multiple forms of capital. 
And then the final section is what I call nurturing the sacred warrior. And it's about self-care. Um, because as I'm sure any of you who have been in activism for very long can attest, um, it's grueling work. And it's really easy if you're not careful to burn yourself out. Right? So how, how do we make sure that we can do this work in the long haul? How do we support ourselves financially, spiritually, socially, so that we can continue uh, this work that, that's so necessary into uh, the years and decades and generations to come? Because, you know, it will be generations to come uh, of work that, that we still have to do. Um, so that is kind of a very short explanation of what's in the book. And what I wanted to do with you all now is just walk you through a couple of these patterns in detail that I think are specifically relevant to the work that, that we're all engaged in in this circle. Um, and to give you an opportunity to reflect on how, how you might relate to them. So the first pattern I want to talk about has to do with edges. So uh, in ecosystems, in ecology, there's this idea of the ecotone. An ecotone is an area where two different ecosystems meet, right? So you could think of where uh, a forest uh, bumps up against a big meadow, or, uh, or tide pools, where the, where the high tide comes in and leaves a little pool in its wake on the beach. And, and in many cases, these are hot spots of biological diversity because you have all of the species from ecosystem A, all of the species from ecosystem B, and then a whole set of species that only exist in that narrow strip where they meet. So there's a lot of interchange. There's a lot of productive friction between all of these different ecosystems that's going on there. And so edges uh, in permaculture landscape design are often things that we're trying to encourage. We're always looking to, to optimize the edge. And often that means making our garden beds, instead of looking like big squares, um, you know, look like lobes or something like that. Right? Um, and edges are also present in society. And most of the time, edges are where innovations come from. Where, uh, you know, I think this, this gathering is at the edge. We have so many different kinds of movements bumping up against each other, creating innovation. Yes, sometimes even friction. Right? But in that friction, we get to think about things differently. And that inspires us to approach a problem from a different way. Right? So edges are super vital in social contexts as well. And in particular, there's a design tool that I want to share called the edge of change. How many people are familiar with uh, the Overton window? Know what that means? A couple folks. So it, it comes from... Um, political science. Um, and it's basically this idea that uh, the Overton window is the range of ideas that are acceptable within a given field in public discourse at any given moment. Right? So if you think about um, something like gun control, um, 20 years ago, things like uh, banning assault weapons nationally was part of the Overton window. But thanks to uh, the vigorous lobbying of the NRA, that is no longer in the Overton window. That's not something that is considered socially acceptable uh, or feasible to propose, right? Because they've moved that Overton window farther in the direction that, that they want to move it. Meanwhile, other things have become part of the Overton window that weren't possible 20 years ago, right? And we could, we could go through the same exercise with all kinds of issues that, that each of you are passionate about. The Overton window is basically what is politically feasible in, in the arena in which you're working, whether that's federal legislation or a PTA meeting, okay? So that is, think of that as one circle. These are all the ideas that are acceptable within the Overton window. Then the other circle is your vision. The future that you know is possible, that you know that we need to create a thriving society. And that might involve all kinds of beautiful, amazing ideas that if you tried to share them uh, with your community at large, people would think you were crazy. Right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't hold on to those ideas and hold them close and find your, your like-minded people like those in this room who agree that uh, you know, we need to talk about overthrowing capitalism. We need to talk about revolution. But you, know, you talk about that in your PTA meeting and good luck, right? Um, and yet there are, some, there are some things that are right at that edge. 
no matter what your vision is, no matter what the Overton window is, there's a few precious things that are right in the middle where there's overlap between what is politically possible at this time and what is truly in your heart for the world that is possible. And that is where we should be working as activists. That is where we should be focusing our energy and hopefully focusing our energy such that we move the Overton window farther in the direction of our own vision and increase that edge, increase the overlap between them. So we start with something that seems very easy and then start to slowly move it by telling inspiring stories um, and by showing that this works uh, farther and farther into our own area. And so what I'd like each of you to do for the next minute or so is to do some kind of variation on this exercise for your own work. Right, so draw, you can draw out a circle of, well, first you might want to start by naming your issue, an issue that you're passionate about and the, the arena, the field in which you're, you're going to be thinking about this. So um, your issue could be climate change and the field could be state level legislation. Or your issue could be um, maybe a living wage and the, the field is within the city of Denver. Right, something like that. So think about that and then draw what is the Overton window of that issue in that domain. And then once you've done that, think about what is your beautiful vision that, that you don't have to share with anybody, but just your fantasy of what you believe is necessary and possible in order for this really to happen. Right, and then start circling or highlighting or starring the things that you feel like are right at that intersection. So we'll just have, we'll give everybody a minute or so to do that. Um, and then after we do that, I'm going to ask you to get together with someone sitting near you who you don't know to talk about uh, what, you've, what you've encountered. Sound good? All right. and pens, if anyone wants. Just raise your hand if you need something to write on or a pen. Yeah, definitely. All right, so if you want to just take another 15, 20 seconds or so, and when you're ready, you can turn to someone near you, hopefully someone who you haven't already connected with much these last couple days, and just start sharing uh, what, what you came up with. And if you're feeling stuck, let the other person help you get unstuck. Um, and we'll see what happens.
What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to wrap up your conversations, make sure everybody's had a chance to share. All right, so I'd love to hear uh, maybe just a couple different examples of some of the conversations that folks had. Um, what were some of the uh, Overton windows that you identified? What are some of the things within there and what are some of the parts of your vision that might intersect with that? Were there any, uh, any kind of aha moments or, or insights that came out of that process for you? Well, I'll uh, talk about uh, the left circle being the one where uh, one has to earn everything mm. uh, altogether. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you don't provide any effort or your talent or your contribution, then you shouldn't get an income or you shouldn't mm -hmm. get a thanks or you shouldn't get um, ac uh, accepted or recognized. The other one is, that we get lots of things free. We get the sun for free, we get uh, intelligence for free, we get the love of God for free, we get a uh, whole variety of things for free. So um, the intersection, the middle part would be to have a universal basic income, right. which uh, every American would get even though they have not earned it, Mm -hmm. But as a result of being an American, they get it just like you would get the, the vote, let's say, or yeah. just like we uh, accept the sun shining on us or uh, the love of our parents towards, towards us. Yeah. So, Thank you. No, that's a great example. I think uh, a UBI is one of those ideas, one of those proposals that was not at all part of our Overton window in politics, you know, three, four years ago, and now is very much so. Um, you know, and it might still very much be at the edge of it, and many of us might feel like we need to go farther than that, right, in, in many different ways, but that's a great example of it wasn't on anybody's radar, and now we're talking about it. Now it's part of the discourse. Great. Yeah. And um, the relationship with indigenous people has been one of evangelization mm. historically in recent memory. And before that, of course, with the papal bulls uh, and the, uh, a, a, a sense of, of uh, violent evangelization, mm -hmm. capture of land, uh, enslavement or murder of indigenous peoples, which became part of the U.S. constitutional interpretation. 
So on the right, uh, on the left side, my vision is just completely do a different constitution that incorporates the values of a biophysical universe that in which we are embedded. And on the right side is a magazine, uh, a monthly magazine by the Jesuits called hmm. America. <laughs> and in the middle is an opportunity I fell into to co-author an article for the magazine about the doctrine of discovery. Wow, that sounds powerful. Any ideas what, any ideas what I should say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of folks would love to chat with you about that, but thank you for sharing that. First of all, I, I wanna uh, commend you for that vision. I think that's such a beautiful idea of a, a constitution that accepts our, our place in, in the biophysical world rather than just our human world. We had a good three-way collaboration here. And uh, the two circles, uh, the society's circle was the short-run focus, and the vision is the long-run focus. Ah, nice. And the intersection, initially some things that we might think about were kind of monetary things, like mm -hmm. housing, mortgages, mm -hmm. uh, retirement savings, mm -hmm. health insurance. But uh, the uh, aha thing <laughs> was the idea of trying to get something that address the ecosystem in there. Mm. And uh, the thought was raised that we should consider ourselves part of the ecosystem instead of the dominators. Oh, I love that. Cool. Yeah, I can tell there's a lot of great, a lot of great conversation. We're not gonna have time to hear all of them. Um, but uh, the organizers of this conference really want you to uh, send in what what came out of these conversations. Um, so Maria's written her email here and she has invited you all, uh, whether uh, you kind of hand it, write it out on a card and take a picture of it, or you type it out in an email, to uh, take this edge of change activity and what came out of it uh, and email it to them as part of the document of uh, one of the, the things that came out of these two days. So I wanna move on to another uh, short exercise that kind of relates to this graphic that I did earlier. Oh, yeah. You Marie at rapidshift.net. All right. Rapid shift, all one word. All right, we good? Everybody got it? Cool. Okay, so this idea of interconnection, right? It's not the number of organisms in an ecosystem that makes it strong, it's the connections between them. It's not the number of different initiatives happening within our broader movement for justice and resilience, it's the number of connections between them that will make it strong. So what, uh, what I see this gathering as being all about is taking all of these isolated dots that are all doing such important work on their own and seeking ways to create interconnections. And not interconnections that's just one more thing to add to our list, one more rally to attend, one more event to plan, um, one more thing that's just gonna make us you know, stay up an hour later every night. But no, mutually beneficial interconnections, things that might actually save us time by partnering with an allied movement things that might make us smarter and stronger and more wise by acting in solidarity with a sister movement. And so I would hope, and from what we all shared at the beginning, I'm pretty confident that most of you have had ideas like that over the course of these last two days. And even if they haven't been crystallized in that exact way, I want you to take the time now to think about these mutual interconnections. How can we take these individual strands of justice and resilience and peace and decarbonization and decolonization that each of us is holding and weave them together into a movement that can resist all of the, the forces that capitalism might be throwing at us? So, you know, that's all very kind of abstract, but, but to make it very uh, specific, think about someone you met or an organization you learned about today that wasn't on your radar or yesterday, that wasn't on your radar before this, 
and think what are some ways that you could make a specific and literal connection with that group, that person, that organization, that movement that will support what they're doing and also support what, you're, what you've been working on, your activism, your business, your nonprofit. Does that make sense to everybody? So identify at least one. Obviously, you can, you can keep going and identify more than that. But let's just start there. Think about what are ways we can weave these different strands together coming out of these two days. And then we'll do something similar, share it back uh, with, with other folks and then hear from the whole group. So you can just take another moment or so to finish collecting your thoughts, writing what you need to write. And when you're ready, turn to another one or two people that's different than the one or two people who you're having the last conversation with. And share back what you wrote, see if there's any overlap, any additional ideas you can come up with as a group.
All right, let's just take another uh, 30 seconds or so. Wrap up your conversations. Okay, I would love to hear uh, a few more examples of what folks ended up chatting about. What are some mutually beneficial interconnections that we can weave moving from the momentum that we built during these couple days onwards into our activist journeys? I was here, I didn't get to meet everybody as much. So I met Doug and we were talking and he's involved with Denver Streets Congress about mobility, bike lanes and access skateboarding, um, whether you have handicaps or not, you know, the ability to get around in the community. And my passion being clean water and less plastic pollution, I'd love to be joining in those conversations to make sure that we have clean water access mm. wherever we go so that we're not having to buy bottled water and destroy our planet through all that. Mm. That's great. Yeah, access to clean water is part of sustainable transportation because if you're not relying on an internal combustion engine to get you around everywhere, you're probably going to get out of, out of breath. You're going to need some water. And if you have to buy bottled water, then then that's creating one problem in the process of solving another. Great connection. What else? Now I heard a lot of good conversations happening, so they must have been about something. Alec, why don't you? Okay. Um, so I was in, I've only been here for today, so my scope is limited um, to what was presented today, but I was in Brian Loma's workshop earlier about water and plastics and I got to th we in that course we were talking about different ways of dealing with this crisis of our plastic problem right now and how it's mounting and one way that I see is really promising is just figuring out ways of mitigating that sequestering our current plastic waste and there's some really interesting and um, I think pretty grounded solutions out there for what to do with that. And that's a whole can of worms that we could get into. But I was thinking that there's also people here with labor unions, mm. poor people's campaign, things that are representing those voices. So um, bringing some of those like technological solutions to let's say low income communities that are also greatly affected by the pollution of this plastic waste, getting these machines out there to those people so that they can utilize them and then mm -hmm. that turns this waste stream into a profitable business model mm. for people in a position of not having that ability in the first place. So that was one thing that I thought of and brought up to our little nice. talk. It reminds me of a policy that really transformed the city in Brazil called Curitiba 30 years ago, right? I'm sure people know, some people know about that, where they had a big problem of people who lacked economic opportunity and a big waste problem. And so they created a policy where people could collect recyclables and exchange them for free bus tokens. Um, and so, you know, it gave people a, an incentive to get all the trash and recycle things off the streets and into the recycling plants. And then it uh, got them, uh, you know, it, it gave them ways to take public transit to their jobs. It created more um, demand for public transit, which then expanded that and got more people out of their cars and basically just created this positive feedback loop. Wonderful. All right, let's maybe hear from one more conversation group. Let's just 
Okay, yeah, we can do two more. That's fine. So this, this Curitiba was very, very interesting. I learned about it about 30 years ago. It was actually initiated by the mayor mm -hmm. of the city, and it had to do with collecting garbage in a very, very um, dangerous part of the city, and the, the garbage collectors wouldn't go in there. Mm. So uh, he rewarded people for any bag of garbage that they would take out, and they would get bus tickets, and now the bus system in Curitiba is a model for people from all over the world, city planners, who go to Curitiba to find out about how to put together a good bus system. It's mm -hmm. just extraordinary. The yeah. one that I had is that uh, uh, I went to hear uh, John's presentation that had to do with time and money, mm. which is a very uh, obvious uh, connection, but he inverted the notion uh, of uh, not putting the emphasis on money, but putting the emphasis on time to evaluate people's work. Mm. And I'm teaching a class on public banking here, and so I asked him to reproduce the paper so that I could distribute it to all of my uh. students in public banking so we can see how this can be incorporated into public banking if it is possible. Fantastic, great. <laughs> Hi. Um, the thought I want to share is indirectly related, which um, I had with this wonderful lady here, my sister here. And um, the gentleman, when he talked about public banking, is helping me to frame that. And that is one of the most destructive, most fundamental teachings of this modern industrialized, especially the modern industrialized culture, is that private profit, private profit is something that is to be taken as, as if it's natural, as if it is how, what, how it was meant to be. So if we could detach from this ideological brainwashing that Profit means my profit or my group's private profit and go to the point of shared profit, which is under, underlies public banking. That would be something that, mm. that we can help Mother Earth greatly with. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, in conversations with Cal and Mercedes just now, I was thinking about the importance of learning communities like this um, and, uh, and the connections that are here and how to keep sustaining them. And I was thinking about the kind of aha happened after we um, were done talking, but realizing that like I could only come for this little window this afternoon and it was I was like, I've got, I, I know I won't regret it if I make the time to go, but I have these deadlines, blah, 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 blah. But so many people probably were interested and in they couldn't and was thinking like, what if on a monthly basis there was like one little opportunity to come together, break bread, like have an activity that we're engaged, but be able to listen and connect with each other. Um, and uh, I just moved to Denver, but I've fallen into this, these different, places, um, and one of them is an accident. I'm accidentally supporting a convening of this regenerative learning communities network, but there's an online platform um, that's just going to be launched in the next month. Um, but a kickoff in Denver, Boulder, they're like looking to create a hub here. Um, and on October 9th, there's gonna be another public lecture. Um, someone named John Fullerton is coming here, um, who's, uh, who had left Wall Street on September 11th. He was an um, executive at, uh, 
at J.P. Morgan, uh, but had a crisis of faith recognizing that that system was bankrupt for the same reasons that our brother over there explained, um, and went on to try to learn and immerse himself in learning more about permaculture. Uh, but there's a talk, and it would be, there'll be an hour after that for more one-on-one -on -one sort of smaller conversations, but it would be great to be able to post, have a place where we could post stuff, and I'm sure like that's going on, but anyway, so that's one thing. October 9th, the evening at 5.30 at the Alliance Center, um, at, uh, yeah, near Union Station. Great. Thanks, and um, actually, uh, a year, a little over a year ago, actually, that group, uh, we had a meeting um, in Boulder, and it was quite expensive. You know, it was like 250 to 550. There was kind of a range, you know. You, uh, if you were maybe a nonprofit, you could go for And at that time, so this was May 2017, um, uh, some of us were chatting, and like, you know, we, we really, we need some, should we, ha should we add on a day? for folks in Colorado and make this free. And, you know, uh, it, it was too short of a notice to have it here. And so that didn't, that didn't happen. But in, in a lot of ways, this is a, uh, and they had that meeting in, in San Francisco this year. So, it, you know, you get kind of intellectual folks together and they share their talks and they're like, oh yeah, we should be doing this. Well, you know, but they're actually not connected to our movements on the ground. Mm -hmm. So this is really what is needed, and, and they are beginning to think about that too, and talk about this area as a hub. But John Fullerton is part of that group, and what is that group? it's leading for well-being, and we all, yeah. So, um, so this is very connected, and um, if there are any folks who are interested in, in beginning to just gather to break bread, to have dinner, maybe a potluck on, on some Fridays or something, go ahead and email me. You know, we live on the west end of town, but we could, we could probably do something like that two Fridays a month. And um, definitely want to continue. Another idea that has come up is how do we have a, sometimes this is called the curriculum project. What are the really essential things um, that begin to need to be shared <laughs> and mm. that we eat, we can share. This conference was a forum. Um, we have, there's actually a space in the Highlands and we thought, you know, the Highlander Center, the Highland Center, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's uh, the garage, uh, the Denver Peace and Justice oh, sure. uh, yeah. uh, uh, cooperates a lot with um, Highlands United Methodist and, and they've said, hey, help us plan, you know, meetings in this space, which is like 40, you know, people. So there's a lot of opportunities to continue the conversation, and we want to, you know, hear your ideas. This is the ultra horizontal conference. You know, this conference is yours. And this is one reason why the time schedule has been very flexible, in addition to that I should not be the one putting <laughs> it together, but uh, next time for sure, someone has to, else has to. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and th thank everybody for. Uh Thank you for sharing your ideas. It's great to just see these kind of sparks starting to form, um, or to use a different for metaphor, seeds being started to uh, sown on the ground. Um, so I want to start uh, winding down this session um, with uh, just kind of opening up the floor uh, for questions or other kind of thoughts about this idea of social permaculture, um, the intersection between ecology, natural systems, and social movements, uh, change for a better world. Um, obviously, I only had the chance to really scratch the surface of a lot of the things that are here in the book. Um, so if folks have questions about any of the other things in there that I mentioned, um, or ways that this idea of social permaculture can help you solve challenges you're experiencing in your own work or activism, uh, this, this is a great opportunity for that. Um, and then I also have a, a few copies of the book uh, here with me if folks want to uh, buy them and, and take them home. So any, any other uh, thoughts or questions? Yeah. Is there a mic or should I just... So one of the themes today is building power. Mm. And I've been thinking about my take on 
on what real power is. Mm -hmm. What does nature and permaculture teach us about what real power is? Mm, I love that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think power personally is the ability to uh, envision a change in a system and manifest it. Um, and so in one of the things that permaculture teaches us is that that is usually best done in collaboration um, with, with all parts of the system. It's usually that, that change that we want to manifest um, if we are to actually make it happen and exercise that power and grow that power has to happen through this process of observation, of creating connections, of visioning in collaboration with others, uh, and, and then of iterating, of trying something, learning from our mistakes, learning from our successes, and growing it in this kind of spiral format. Um, and there's you know, certainly very concrete and specific ways that permaculture um, can talk about building power. Um, in one of the patterns in my book is about power analysis, which actually came from the kind of community organizing movement in, in LA 10, 15 years ago, but I found useful for all kinds of other work. Um, so, you know, plotting out who are the stakeholders, who has power currently, um, how, uh, how, to what extent are they aligned with your vision or opposed to your vision, and how can you either take the people who are aligned with your vision and don't have power and get them more power, or how can you take the people who have already have power and are neutral and get them to be in favor of what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think power, uh, sometimes in, in our movements we're, we're afraid of power, Right? We're afraid to talk about being powerful because it, it feels like it's autocratic. Um, but the truth is change doesn't happen without power, without uh, creating a vision of what you want to see and manifesting it. Right? And so we need to be willing to be powerful. We need to own our power, but, but to wield it responsibly. And unfortunately, we've been traumatized by so much power that's been wielded irresponsibly um, that I think many of us who are sensitive uh, to that are, are afraid of our own power. That is so profound. I think, I mean, for me, <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to that like 10 times. There's a, there's a bunch in there for me. I'm glad we're recording then, huh? <laughs> Um, I really appreciate that question. It resonates with me. I appreciate the answer that you gave, but also the way that you talked about building power in the community that you're in. Um, mm -hmm. It's rich. And, you know, I, I, there are a couple of things that struck out. One, like, there's an article that Danella Meadows, Dana Meadows mm -hmm. wrote that had, um, I think it was 12 places to intervene in mm -hmm. a system and the different levels of power. And originally when she wrote that list, the most powerful place to intervene in the system was at the level of paradigm. Um, and to be able to have that vision and that core mental construct and be able to shift it, like the different glasses that were mentioned earlier, like the paradigm shift, you can just put on a different pair of glasses to get to regenerative frame. And then she amended it. Um, she was like, that's not the most powerful place to intervene. The most powerful place to intervene is to develop the capacity not to be attached to any one paradigm. Um, and so I think, like in my experience in working in a super contested landscape in Austin, um, that was experiencing tremendous uh, success by the dominant standards of success, a creative class economy, and mm -hmm. all these people coming in to be part of it, which is a lot like what we have here in Denver. Um, I had to be really mindful that my vision wasn't one that I was stuck to and that mm. I could see all of the places in it and that that did give me, uh, that non-attachment gave me a lot more power to be creative and to hold the space in an environment that had lots of diversity and it had a lot of relationships, but the quality of the relationships was horrible. And most of the quality of the relationships was lots of different ways where people were dominating or resisting mm -hmm. being dominated. Um, and then to be able to create the kind of connections, the mutually beneficial relationships built on awareness and end up having a different kind of power to self-organize that uh, and that like the ecotone, like if you just think of diversity and the tension there, I, I learned last week that ecotone meant home and tension. Mm -hmm. And like you name the friction and how can we 
hold the space to allow real tensions that have histories that go far back and allow that all to be and still be able to tap the creative energy in it and direct it into commonly pursued visions. Like that's a basis of power that I really, I'm like, so I didn't know about your story. I'm so deeply, profoundly moved <laughs> by, I can't wait to go to our grow house. So yeah. thank Great. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I grew up in the area and grow house is the coolest place. The, the I don't know, there, there's something about being there. I encourage all of you to go there. So I have a question about, so my, yesterday, when you were talking about permaculture, you had put sustainability at the mm. center, right? Mm -hmm. And you've been using the word regenerative a lot. Yeah. And Daniel Christian Wall, when he talks about regenerative, talks about how we sort of makes a distinction between being regenerative and being sustainable. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that regenerative can sort of restore itself when it gets hit, that it's mm -hmm. more, that it's, it's not just about surviving at some sort of minimal level. So could you talk a little bit about how, and maybe both of you, about how you see that, dis is there a distinction for you and how you see that distinction between sustainable, which we've heard a lot at this, at this conference, mm -hmm. and regenerative, which we've also heard a lot at this conference? Yeah, totally. And I'm, I'm guessing my uh, way of approaching that question is probably pretty similar to Michael's, but if you have anything to say after I do, Michael, feel free to chime in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a difference, and it's a really critical one. Um, I mean, for one thing, sustainability as a term is, is so overused these days and so watered down, so greenwashed, um, that, that I just don't use it because it feels so meaningless. Um, but there is a, a substantive difference, and, and I think you started to name it, where, uh, you know, sustainability is about continuing, sustaining something that's existing, keeping it going. Um, but it's, it's not, it doesn't say anything about where it's going or the values that underlie uh, what is being sustained, right? Because we could sustain, we could seek to sustain this extractive global capitalist system for as long as we can and call that sustainability as long as we're doing it. But is that really what we're trying to sustain, right? Um, and, and furthermore, uh, you know, if you look at in terms of complex systems, there's sustainability is kind of this midpoint it's, it's this, this kind of fulcrum between a degenerative system that gets uh, less and less valuable the more time goes by. So if you think about um, like a car, it's never, unless it's like a super fancy classic car, it's never gonna be as valuable as when you drive it off the lot because it's, it's a mechanical system and it's subject to the forces of entropy. It breaks down. So therefore it's degenerative. So that's on one hand. And then the other hand is of course regenerative, like a fruit tree where the longer time goes by, the more value it gets, at least for, for at least a few generations. Um, and so uh, it, it becomes more, it creates abundance just through existing. And so regenerative systems, one where we start a cycle, um, but then it creates momentum of its own that, that gets bigger than any one of us, that's what we're trying to create in permaculture, whereas sustainable is, is much more about just like trying to design something that is less bad, right? That shrinks our footprint rather than grows our handprint. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, sustainable is better than degenerative. It's better than extractive. It's better than exploitative. Um, but I want more than that. I, I want a, a world that's not just sustaining. I want one that's thriving. Michael, any, anything else you have to say about that? Uh, no, the point of the slide that I show was just the Venn di diagram of the ethos of permaculture and then sustainability was the initial catchphrase that they use. It definitely has changed over time. My point by the slide was was that how often as permaculturalists, my observation is, is that that Venn diagram, even though it's equal, opposite, laterally opposed and designed to be balanced, that most often when we, as permaculture practitioners, that ethos is out of balance. You know, the fair share doesn't carry as much weight as the environmental impact. And then oftentimes, as Adam alluded to, um, some of us permaculturalists don't have the social skills to really, uh, you know, the Jerome story was great, <laughs> yeah. um, to, to, you know, really do the people care part of it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, um, um, I'm definitely for regenerative, um, but with 
with uh, either paradigm my point was was that we need to be grounded in the ethos and that we need to make sure that that e ethos is balanced mm. and that we need to start working towards what that balance looks like so that we can gain our traction towards sustainability so that we can start putting real things in the future and that's what I was um, getting to when I was discussing about colonialist permaculture mm -hmm. and indigenous knowledge and how they need to, how in, in many ways they align, but um, there are some colonialist mindset things that we do that um, affect outcomes and we need to be cognizant of that and start thinking um, um, more with uh, uh, an indigenous framework. And so that was, that was my point by pointing out that shy, uh, showcasing that slide but just like Adam said you know we'd, we'd all like to work towards a regenerative system we just but earlier exercise we need to meet the system where it's at mm. we need to start pushing those edges yeah well said thank you Michael thank you brother Michael for again helping it's like Beautiful. The, first, the last person that speaks helps me <laughs> connect. What I wanted to talk about is power and how, how infected in this culture it is with violence, mm. which is a result of sustained brainwashing by forces of colonization. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether the, it's we are dealing with people who are colonized or have been colonizers. Both are victims. Yeah. And, and the notion of power as that which gives you the ability to be violent, therefore you create deterrence against being violated. Mm -hmm. And that kind of power is toxic at the level of its intent, which then at the level of action, when that intent is then translated into action in the quote unquote real world, then it becomes Raytheons and becomes <laughs> bombs and <laughs> missiles and Wall Street, uh, you know, savagery. So power in and of itself doesn't have to be violent. And if we, but, but the level of conditioning in this, especially in the modern industrialized hyper whatever culture is so profound that if we at any given moment, when we, especially let's say, if we watch Fox News just to learn you know, learn from the enemy, so to speak, <laughs> if we could just ask what narrative am I being brainwashed with at this point, and you will see that violent power is a very major aspect of those narratives. And to resist that, to say no, non-violently, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in our earlier conversation about power, you know, we, we didn't get into this idea that, that there's different things that can fuel power. And I think most power that's exercised in our sick culture is, is fueled by fear, um, even if it's not always acknowledged in that way. But even those who have, and maybe especially those who have the most power in today's society, have the most fear. Um, and then, that, you know, that's a power over. That's, that's a power... To, to be able to manipulate others and force them. Um, and I think the power that we're trying to build in, this, in these spaces is power with, right? It's, it's power in solidarity. It's the power that's fueled by hope and the power that's fueled by love. And, and they operate very differently. Um, then, you know, in English, we, we have one word for both of them, but they're, they're very different beings. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about books and the power of spreading good ideas, book, good books. Um, you can buy a book and you can keep it in your personal library. You can share it with friends. You can also 
donate your copy to the local Little Free Library, and mm -hmm. people don't have to pay for it. They can just see it on a on a shelf at the you know park or, the, or or whatever. And you can also fill out a library purchase request. You know, go to your library and say, mm -hmm. I would like you to spend our community dollars and and please buy this book. So those are opportunities to share. And you could also build community around books by making a little free library if there isn't one. Or a book club. I've, I've uh, participated in and actually a few folks have read my book for a book club and that's been a really powerful way of kind of engaging with this kind of work and sharing it with other people too. Yeah, Yeah. in fact, um, anyone who wants to do that in this group, let's, um, let's read Adam's book and also a couple of us in this uh, uh, group, there, there's one woman who wasn't able to come this weekend but really helped put the conference together. You know, we've put together this uh, huge book list. Like, mm. in fact, anybody who has a Kindle or an Amazon account, or well, actually you don't, it's desirable to not have one because then you can <laughs> log into this one and share the books. <laughs> So just cool. let us know. And I just wanted to give special thanks um, before we wrap up here to Rhiannon because Rhiannon is my partner on the Colorado IPL board. And it's like at one point this spring we were the, uh, there were a couple other people left, but they were moving out of state. They were retiring. So it was like really just going to be us uh, this year at this point. <laughs> And we've met many other new people. So if you're, you know, a person of faith who is thinking about this stuff, we, we definitely want to be working with you. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Rhiannon is, has been just such an invaluable partner, even through the total uh, kind of overtaxing of the last <laughs> couple of months. So. All right. Um. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, wind things down just by sharing some uh, ways that I would love to stay connected with you all because um, I've just been so inspired by uh, all of your experience and wisdom that's shown through during this conversation and, and throughout these couple days. Um, so my website is uh, adambrock.me. Um, my email address is wildgreenyonder at gmail.com. Um, there's one more uh, website I want to write down in a minute, but in case you're interested in uh, learning more about The Grow House, it's uh, thegrowhouse.org, um, and house is spelled H-A-U-S. Um, and then, if you're interested in learning more about permaculture, um, I am, uh, along with some of my co-teachers, uh, about to start our eighth year of the Denver Permaculture Design Course. Um, which is just this kind of life-changing immersion in the principles and practices of permaculture, both physical and social. Um, we, have, we're, we have, I think, two or three spots left. It starts uh, the first weekend of October, so uh, just two weeks from now. And it's one weekend a month for seven months. Um, and it's just, uh, in addition to all the amazing content, it's a really amazing group of people that you build bonds with over the course of those seven months. Um, and then lastly, if any of you are interested in kind of getting more in depth uh, with your own group or organization around social permaculture um, or any of the topics we talked about today, uh, I'd love to connect with you. Um, there's nothing I love more than um, assisting groups who are working for social change to help them work better. Um, so thank you so much uh, for joining me uh, this afternoon, for joining us for these two days, and for all of your work for a better world.